Please introduce yourself. My name is Eric Ruder. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I've lived there about 15 years. And I've been a Palestine solidarity activist for all of that time, really. Um, I've uh, done all sorts of different things in that regard, and it's been a great experience just coming to meet people from all over the world in many different walks of life. But I, I had the pleasure and the privilege to travel to uh, Gaza in 2009 as part of a humanitarian um, aid mission to break the siege. Uh, and more recently, I've been involved in uh, efforts in Chicago around academic freedom in particular. There's two pretty kind of well-known cases at this point. One it has been resolved in our favor. We actually won a victory. Um, the professor Ayman Shahadi teaches uh, at a small kind of arts college called Columbia College in downtown Chicago. And he's taught a course called the Israel-Palestine Conflict for a few years. And every once in a while, some students would come forward with accusations that because he gave the Palestinian point of view, he somehow exhibited bias. And most recently, um, about a year ago, he showed the film Five Broken Cameras. It's a documentary. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. it. An Oscar-nominated uh, film. That's, I interviewed the guys. Oh, yeah. I, I had Burnett. Yeah, yeah, it's about... Both of them. Yeah. The brothers who were involved in the nonviolent struggle in, in the West Bank town of Berlin. To um, you know, to, to drive out the occupying forces, or to at least defend their own homes from demolition and, and land seizures and so on. And after showing this film, again, he he was there was a complaint against him to the dean, and uh, they called him into the to the dean's office and said he needed to to teach in a more balanced way. Well, that's a very troubling concept when it comes to academic freedom because you hire professors to give their point of view and saying that you demand balance would sort of be like saying well if you're going to teach about the civil rights movement you need to balance the perspective of the civil rights activists with the views of the segregationists who want to keep you know separate but equal intact the slaveholders yeah the slaveholders exactly so and the jim crow apartheid type conditions you know of which is very similar to what's going on in israel today and so um, after a kind of social media campaign, a picket, a, uh, some meetings on campus, in fact, uh, Ayad Bernat came to, to Chicago at that time and spoke on Ayman Shahadi's behalf. We actually did succeed in getting the university to reinstate the one of two sections of the class that they had just sort of um, unilaterally canceled. Their justification was that there wasn't sufficient student interest, but every time he'd offered the class it had always packed out and when they reinstated it of course it packed out again um, and so that was one of their many bogus justifications that we went through in order and, and before we finally won uh, the victory. So we are here in San Diego this is the 13th annual um, uh, US campaign uh, and occupation. Tell me why are you here? Well I've been to a couple of these before and it's really a great organization in the sense that it is an organization of organizations. So as an, as an organization, it brings together many different currents of the, of the movement for Palestinian rights and for Palestinian liberation. So you have the faith-based organizations. You have the student groups like Students for Justice in Palestine. You have various Palestinian and Arab and Muslim organizations. You have Palestinian community groups. Um, you know, it goes on and on. Um, there are, uh, you know, so many different organizations and people doing interesting campaigns, boycott, divestment and sanctions campaigns and so on. And then these issues of academic freedom that have cropped up, very high profile case now around the academic uh, named Stephen Salaita, who is a professor of American Indian Studies. He was offered a position at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and then because he was sending out tweets on his personal account that were critical and angry about the bombing of Gaza this summer by Israel, um, they said they fired him even before he stepped in the classroom, even though he had signed a contract, uh, sorry, signed a letter, uh, an offer letter that he would um, teach there and had resigned his position at Virginia Tech where he used to teach. So I come to this conference to network with many other people across the country from all these different backgrounds and walks of life who are doing these similar sorts of efforts. And, um, you know, I really think that this is a, kind of a unique organization within the Palestinian uh, solidarity movement because it really does bridge all these different networks. Uh, introduce us to Steve Salida. 
So Stephen is a um, uh, professor of American Indian Studies, as I said, and he taught for eight years, I believe, at Virginia Tech. Uh, very well respected, had great student recommendations, and um, you know worked in a very collegial. Tenure. Yeah, tenured professor worked in a collegial manner. I mean, he was given various kinds of departmental roles that he fulfilled admirably, and so on. And um, he and his wife also worked at Virginia Tech, and they he got this offer because the American Indian Studies program had an opening, and they the 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 uh, professors, the faculty in that in that program thought that his credentials were excellent. And as happens uh, in every kind of university appointment pretty much across the country at various universities, they the academic vetting of his application was done. Th he thoroughly checked out. Um, and he was the person that they decided to extend the offer to. When they extend the offer, they have a kind of line that's put in every um, offer, but it is more or less a formality. And the line says, contingent upon approval by the Board of Trustees. Um, but they went ahead and sent him an offer letter, which he signed. They, um, I believe, were helping him to coordinate his move to Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he had begun various departmental orientation things. They had, he had ordered the books for his class. Um, all these things had already begun. So basically, he's hired, he's ready to teach, the fall semester is approaching. Um, and then there is Israel's bombing campaign, which starts up with such ferocity in July. And, you know, he is this professor of indigenous studies whose whole focus has been on the way in which the United States basically exterminated the Native American population here. And, you know, he's kind of one of the people best known in the field for doing this comparative work around the Native American struggle and the Palestinian struggle against genocide, extermination, uh, settler colonialism. That's correct. And um, so when, uh, when he, when these, when a, a couple of high profile, well, actually more wealthy donors um, got wind of the fact that the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign was about to hire him, they, um, they put in a call to the chancellor and said, we're troubled by this. And um, it's now emerged that you know the kind of combined pressure of uh, several of the organizations that typically patrol are the sort of political police when it comes to the, the issue of Israel-Palestine, combined with the pressure from some what self-described six-figure donors, um, basically led the chancellor to short circuit the entire academic vetting of his application and just give him, basically tell him, you know what, the Board of Trustees is not going to improve your uh, appointment here, even after, like I said, he had resigned his position, sold his house, was moving to Urbana-Champaign, and so it's left him, his wife, and his young kid in this horrible situation. Now, there's been really quickly a, a, a movement that has built up. Some 18,000 plus individuals have signed a petition of support for Stephen Slide on change.org. Some 5,000 academics from across the country and around the world have said they will not participate in any seminars, speeches, lectures, appointments at the University of Illinois until Stephen Salida is reinstated. And um, 16 academic departments at the campus have voted no confidence in the chancellor for her unilateral move to basically cave to pressure um, that had nothing to do with the academic credentials or teaching background of Stephen Salida. Um, and so, um, they recently voted. So what are their demands? What's the demands for uh, regarding Stephen Slider? So the, the basic demand is that the university should, should reinstate him, that he was uh, an employee that they fired and terminated without due process and without uh, really any cons like regard to the academic question. So that's why it's such a blatant violation of academic freedom and of freedom of speech. So the demand is that he should be reinstated immediately. Um, and uh, that will, can, people are continuing to organize. There's actually a, one of the things that's happened is that it's kicked up a pretty vibrant movement on campus. So you have the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter, the Graduate Student Union, the, a number of faculty, um, are all kind of making common cause around the issue of Stephen Salida. And each of these groups also has their own employment-related issues with the university because there's like, for example, a the non-tenure-track faculty at the university have a, have a, a union 
they're involved in trying to get aspects of their contract renegotiated. The faculty themselves who are tenured don't have a union, but they've been talking about an or a union organizing drive. I think that has now accelerated quite a bit. And so um, this has really kind of kicked up a, a high level of activism on campus. People are very angry that on September 11th, a fitting date I guess, the Board of Trustees voted to um, stand by Chancellor Wise's decision to fire Stephen. They voted eight to one, which shows even a little bit of discomfort at least one of the board members. And um, But despite that vote, I mean, I think that there is a very serious movement on campus that's going to continue, and I think there's going to be ongoing efforts to continue to amplify and increase the boycott uh, call and campaign to make them realize that, you know, as a university, you can't go around making um, uh, decisions that violate academic freedom and think that that's just going to be fine and people will forget about it, which is clearly what they hope. Yeah, and it's been going on for many years now, uh, anywhere from anti-war movements uh, to, especially with Palestinian Israeli issues that be, has become a really hot point. As soon as one professor says something about in defense of uh, human rights of Palestinians, they all, you know, be let go and be fired. I want to bring back, um, you mentioned that you have attended the end occupation uh, 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 meetings uh, mm -hmm. many years. Have you seen, what changes have you seen? Um, really promising and encouraging ones, truthfully. Um, I think it's, this is the biggest conference ever. It's also, I think, the most diverse conference ever. I mean, um, more young people, more Arab and Muslim people, um, and just, you know, an overall, I think, higher level of excitement and optimism that, you know, for the last um, 60 plus years, the Palestinians have been getting kicked around pretty, pretty badly. And yet, at the same time, um, clearly we are reaching a moment where there is a new consciousness, a new possibility to bring this issue to, to larger numbers of people, in, you know, broadly speaking. And I think a lot of people here feel that possibility, and that's why it's bigger and kind of more um, confident, more exciting, more dynamic than it's been. How do you assess the uh, attack on Gaza, the uh, uh, defensive edge? Uh, protective edge. Pr protective edge, thank you. Um, do you uh, how do you see that? How does it affect you as a person uh, since you're involved with a BDS organization and, and occupation? I mean, it was a really horrible time this summer to watch um, the bombs drop on Gaza day in and day out. And to me, I think the only way that you can kind of put in context what it represented was that this really was an attempt by Israel to advance their overall project of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. There's really nothing smaller than that that they were aiming at because all of the different justifications, military, political, and otherwise that they gave were empty. Um, they wanted to demilitarize Gaza. Well, well, if that was their aim, they failed. They wanted to destroy the tunnels. Well, you know what, if you want to destroy the tunnels, you could have done what Egypt did, which is destroy the tunnels without ever actually crossing. If the tunnels start in Gaza and end in Israel, then you, you've got access to the tunnel without having to cross the border. Um, Egypt closed many tunnels without ever stepping foot in Gaza. Israel could have done the same, but that wasn't their point. They wanted war, and they knew that the kidnapping of those three Israeli settler hitchhikers, but that that was the uh, their, the pretext that they needed, and that's why they hid the fact that that they knew that they had been killed right away, and they used a couple weeks of a frantic kind of panic that they built up to prepare the ground for this military campaign. And then I think the other objective was to really frustrate the unity government that was starting to form between Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. The reason being that Hamas was basically signaling as part of that unity agreement that all the things that Israel demanded of Hamas in the past, they were prepared to concede now. They were prepared to say, you know, um, we recognize Israel, we uh, are, we're going to be bound by all the previous agreements between the Palestinian Authority and Israel and so on and so forth. And the problem for Israel is that they did not want to say, they did not want the answer to be yes on all of their demands because the problem would be that once that happens, they might be faced with actually having to make concessions themselves. And so um, that really, to me, kind of made up the core motivations and, and, and strategic goals that Israel had. 
And truthfully, they only really care, I think, about two things, their own population, as far as their opinion of what happened in Gaza, and the opinion of the U.S. political and economic establishment. And so far, they were able to maintain support of both of those groups. What they don't care about, but I think the movement will have to make them care about, is the opinion of everyone else in the world. And um, I think that we may now be um, looking at new what we are looking at new possibilities in that regard because I think so many people saw what happened, were horrified by it, don't buy the idea that this was proportionate response and so on and so forth that Israel tried to, to say. But the question is, is there organizational muscle, movement, um, momentum that can actually compel people to pay attention to these dynamics? You know? and, and that's, that's the, what this conference that's is what all this about. Conference is all about. Uh, thank you very much. If you'd like to add anything, you're more than welcome, but thank you very I much. Think, I think that was a great interview. Thank you. Uh, thank you.